What caused the Beef Baron Wars? Well, to answer that, you need to understand who those so-called barons were, and the history that drove them to war in the first place. Three thousand cycles ago, our forefathers landed on this forsaken world. Not much of their story remains, faded to dust, like the tech they brought with them. There's little left of what this planet was supposed to be. Back then, it was said to be A-graded, an oasis among the stars. Turns out, it was closer through G-rated, barely habitable. Those who came saw their dreams burn up in the atmosphere. Fewer ships make the journey out here as the cycles pass. Stranded, our ancestors were left to scrape out a life in the dirt, watching as their technology slipped away. You can only fix a machine so many times before you run out of parts. But that's old news. You didn't come here to listen to ancient history. So let's skip ahead. 150 cycles ago, settlers, real desperate ones, made their way east to the Cinder Plains. They were running from a civil war back west. I don't blame them. It was chaos back there. They thought they could make a fresh start, maybe carve out a slice of peace for themselves and the merry fellow greens. But what they didn't count on were the tribals. Fias, those tribes were, guarded the greens like their lives depended on it, which truth be told, they did. And when the settlers tried pushing further, the tribals sent them packing. We didn't leave empty handed though. Took some of their cattle with a stingly. A victory of sorts, small as it was. They settled the land to the north of the Great Dry, the vast desert that divides the world in two. Law was scarce, but then again, so were riches. Gangs, raiders, things that tended to pop up in lawless places weren't much of a thing. Too little to steal meant no incentive to do so. My great-great-grandfather came here during those times. He had it good. Land to call his own. Peace to work it. If there was ever a time when life on Christmark felt like it could be good, that was it. Then everything went to hell after he died. The civil war back west might have ended, but unrest only grew. More wars looked inevitable, and people started to flood into our region like locusts. Towns sprung up, where there was once only wide stretches of empty land. And with them came cattle markets and tradesmen, trying to scratch out of living. The ones without skills? They were just cheap labor, another resource to exploit. And exploit they did. Some of the larger ranching families grew fat off the profits. It wasn't long before a few of them started calling themselves barons staking claims over land that stretched further than they could ever walk in a day. They began gobbling up the smaller ranches around them, either through deals or by force. Their cattle were their wealth, and they guarded it fiercely. Soon enough, independent ranchers couldn't breathe without a barren shadow looming over them. The barons set up tax on every ranch unlucky enough to be within their reach. 20, 30, sometimes 40% of all cattle went straight to them. In exchange, the smaller ranches got a promise of protection and the right to work in peace. If they could call it peace, it was more like servitude. Not everyone bent the knee, though. Some families, stubborn as wild cattle, packed up and crossed the Great Dry, heading south to settle in what would come to be known as Redstone Flats. The town of Duspile Gulch was formed on that day. The northern barons didn't bother chasing them. They were too wrapped up in their own schemes. Paranoid, their neighbor would stick a knife in their back while they were busy crossing the desert. But you know how it goes. Same story, different names. Down in Redstone Flats, small ranches grew into big ones. And soon enough, the same thing started happening. Families with enough wealth and muscle started calling themselves barons, too, carving up the land the way their northern counterparts had done not so long prior. Thankfully for the southern families, the Les and their family clan gained prominence early on and set a precedent, 
protection was free for anyone in the region, and donations were only necessary if peace was desired. A simple system, really. If you wanted to keep your cattle, your land, maybe even your life, you made sure the Lezendaires had what they needed. If they didn't, well, peace had its price, and that was the standard for all barons of the south who followed. Now you've got to understand, these barons would squabble and skirmish every now and then. They're human, after all. But none of them wanted a real war. They all enjoyed their little bubbles of power, lording over the landowners like small kings. They trade cattle by day and drink by night, gathering at events and laughing like they weren't scheming behind each other's backs. It was an unspoken agreement, rivalry without bloodshed, but you could only pretend for so long. Eventually, someone, somewhere, always wants more. Victor Hale. He was that someone. He was different. Came from a middling baron family. Not even the next in line. Not too rich, not too poor. When the head of his family died under mysterious circumstances, Heo lessled control over his cousins with a grip of iron. Young, cold-blooded, and calculating. None of them saw the ambition burning inside him. Not until it was too late. He swallowed up the landowners around him with a combination of force and promises, bringing them under his control. And he wasn't quiet about it, either. Made it clear to his neighboring barons. If they so much as thought of taking back their lost lands, he'd bring total war to their gates. No frets, no negotiations. But Hale's rise wasn't built on intimidation alone. Enter the Yam Banking Establishment, a shadowy group tied to the West, known for funding ventures in far-flung corners of the Rim. Hale mortgaged his family Palot and Heard, in doing so, gambled away his freedom for a chance at something bigger. With their funds, he secured a loan that bought him something few could ever dream of. Genetically enhanced calves. Procured from out-of-planet traders who happened to be passing through. The region's traditionalists noticed immediately. Hale had bet the ranch, literally, on a chance to change the game. For two cycles, the Hale Lanch was under siege. Raids, sabotage, arson, you name it. But Hale held out. He was playing for stakes no one else could see. Now, unless you've got ranching in your blood, you don't understand the prize those calves were. 
typical beef cattle, if well fed and well kept, weigh between 1,000 to 1,400 pounds at the processing stage. These creatures hail bought, they tip the scales at 5,000 pounds at the lightest. Hulking beasts of beautiful potential, grotesque in size, but Hale saw beyond the absurdity. He saw profit. Riches beyond imagination were there for the taking, all flowing straight into the Hale coffers. Many in the region begged for a chance to get in on it, pleaded, plotted, even bribed. But Hale shut them all out. His alliance with the Yam Bankmer establishment paid off, and when his massive cattle hit the slaughterhouse, Hale paid his debts in full. What was left in his hands, in abundance of resources, and he didn't waste any time. The mercenaries came next, more experienced killers, hired from back west. Hale used them like scalpels, enforcing his will over the land around him. The neighboring barons saw the writing on the wall. They bent the knee, handed over their baron rights, and hoped Hale's hunger for land would be sated. For not everybody bowed. There was one family that resisted, the Vendlers. Stubborn as they came, they refused Hale's demands, holding fast to their land and their pride. For that, they were erased, scorched from existence. Hale had their ranch burned to the ground, their cattle driven off into the night. Brutality wasn't just his method, it was his message. There would be no negotiation, no surrender, only absolute obedience. Victor Hale didn't stop after the Venders. He couldn't. His hunger for power was insatiable. One by one, landowners and barons alike were swallowed into his domain. They all fell in line, known full well what resistance would bring. With Hale at the helm, the region reformed, united under one family, snowballed into Victor's control. It wasn't long before Ironspine Plateau, once fragmented and independent, became something else entirely. The old ways, the traditions that held the region together for cycles, quickly eroded. Modern methods, brought in from outside, collided with the ways of life their folk in Cinder Plains had once respected. The cattle barons had always looked west with suspicion, but under Hale's rule, they found themselves staring directly into the future they had resisted for so long. But that future came at a steep price. Under Hale's iron rule, taxes were raised to 70%, a crushing weight for any rancher, no matter their size. And worse still, Hale imposed a draft. 
Every family under the Iron Brand Coalition was forced to surrender one of their children, as young as 12, to serve in his grown militia. In return, the parents were given 200 silver, a coal trade for their own blood. Those who refused, they were faced with the foul brunt of Hale's fury. There wasn't a choice, it was an ultimatum. This degradation of traditional values, Hale's complete disregard for the ways of beef ranching that had sustained the people of Sin the Plains, did not go unnoticed. And it did not go unanswered. The southern barons, outraged by Hale's accumulation of power and the choking taxes he imposed, responded in kind. They formed the Dust Horn Confederacy. But if the Iron Bland was an empire, the Dust Horners were a loose band of rebels. No one leader, no unified vision. Just a collection of ranchers and landowners, too stubborn to bow to Hale's demands. They were underfunded, ill-organized, and not all the small ranchers were eager to paint a target on their backs by joining this confederacy. Some just wanted to survive, to stay out of the thick of it. Jareth Cole was one of them, a rancher with a herd of 60 cattle. Small fry, even by the standards of the more easygoing ranchers, he lived north of the southern region of the Dry. And for most of the early clashes, in what would become the beef bound wars, he kept his head bound, stayed out of trouble. The Dust Horners, however, were not so lucky. Hale sent three squadrons south, testing the mettle of the Dust Horners. Green soldiers, barely trained, far from home, the Dust Horners won quick victories over them, sending them fleeing back north. Feeling emboldened, they organized a premature victory parade. Convinced that the war was over, that Hale would never return. This is where they miscalculated. The Dust Horners didn't understand Hale yet. What they saw as a victory was nothing more than a test in his eyes. He was willing to sacrifice lives to gauge their strength. And he was far from finished. Two cycles passed after the so-called victory. In that time... Hale rebuilt. The Iron Brand militia swelled in size and discipline. The South had celebrated, but Hale had been training his soldiers, training them for something much bigger. The Dust Horners thought they were defending Dust, but the Hale, it was about domination. He had enough troops to push the tribals from the lush, green east, but he chose not to. He turned his forces south 